Thank you for that lovely introduction. It's really a terrific honor to be here and also terrifically fun. I hope you guys find it so as well. So as you just heard, I am an expert in being wrong. <laughs> and I hate to break it to you, but so are all of you. <laughs> this, is, this is one of your wonderful human birthrights, right? You use language, you use tools, you have opposable thumbs, and you get stuff wrong. And we all know this, right? In fact, every major account of what it means to be a human being whether that account comes to us from religion, or philosophy, or science, or psychology, all of these acknowledge and pay homage to the fact that we are fundamentally fallible creatures. And we acknowledge this in our everyday lives, too, right? This is why we say things like, to err is human, and everybody makes mistakes. And it's why we hold conferences where we get together and we talk about failure, about the inevitability of error, and even the importance of embracing those mistakes on the theory that sometimes they are one of our best engines of innovation and learning and change. So in the abstract, we're really great at accepting the fact that we make mistakes. And in the concrete, we're terrible at it. And one of the things that interests me is we're terrible at this even when we're wrong about totally trivial things. <laughs> I once had a guy tell me about this argument that he'd gotten into with some friends at a party. He was on the losing side of the argument. And uh, although it had happened many years previously, he remembered it, remembered it in tremendous detail. This argument was about how many carbohydrates are in a jar of pickles. Right? I mean, seriously, I can't think of anything less important than this. I also don't know the answer, so don't ask me. I also once had a man confess to me that sometimes when he's in the middle of arguing with his wife and he suddenly realizes that he's wrong and she's right, instead of just admitting that fact, he starts spontaneously inventing imaginary facts <laughs> to support his position. You guys are laughing because you've done this. <laughs> so in theory, we have this wonderful philosophical appreciation for our capacity to get stuff wrong. And then we actually make a mistake, and what do we do? Well, as often as not, we deny it. We get defensive about it. We blame it on somebody else or we come up with these amazingly inventive explanations for why, yeah, you know what, we actually really weren't that wrong after all. So if this is how we behave when we're wrong about really trivial things, you know, pickles, you can imagine what happens when we're wrong about things that actually matter, about the whereabouts of weapons of mass destruction, or the safety features on an oil rig or the stability of our housing market, the identity of a murder suspect, the integrity of our money manager, the fidelity of our spouse, or any of the many, many beliefs we have that are hugely consequential and that help us understand ourselves and make sense of the world around us. So what I want to talk about today is this gap between our abstract understanding that, of course, we get stuff wrong, and then, on the other hand, our real ineptitude with dealing with our mistakes. Now, given that we understand that collectively, as a species, we get things wrong, and given that we're actually extremely good, arguably too good, at recognizing the mistakes or the putative mistakes of other people, you might think that the problem here is that we fail to look inward. You know, that we don't stop and scrutinize our own soul for the possibility that we're making a mistake. I want to suggest today that actually that's exactly backward. That the problem is we do search our souls to figure out if we've made a mistake. In fact, that's one of the only ways we try to figure out if we've made a mistake 
and it's going to fail us every single time. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Can I uh, get my slides, please? Oh, not that one. Here, I can fix that, maybe. That one. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite optical illusions. Some of you guys might have seen it before. Uh, here's the trick. The square labeled A and the square labeled B are the exact same shade of gray. Right. So you're having a little bit of trouble believing me because you're looking at this thing for yourself and it's incredibly self-evident <laughs> that these two squares are different colors. So let me shake up your sense of certainty about that just a little bit. OK, now it's not quite as self-evident, right? So the reason I like this illusion is that it helps us understand that a feeling of certainty about something does not necessarily suggest that we're accurate, OK? And what I want to talk about today, and what's interesting to me here, is this deep inner feeling of accuracy. And in particular, I want to try to encourage everybody here to not be seduced by that feeling. Because as we see from the earlier slide, it actually is quite seductive. So I want to tell you two quick stories about it. Uh, the first one takes place in 1941. And it concerns this 13-year-old kid who's sitting at home listening to a Major League Baseball game on the radio, when suddenly an announcer breaks in and delivers an extremely urgent bulletin, because the Japanese have just bombed Pearl Harbor. Now, as you can imagine, this experience made a huge impression on this kid. In fact, these kinds of experiences make huge impressions on all of us. I'm sure everybody here knows exactly where they were on September 11, 2001. I know I do. Psychologists call these kinds of experiences flashbulb memories, because it's like they happen and a camera goes off and, and freezes the frame in perfect, lucid detail. And that's what happened to this kid. right? He carried around this memory of the baseball game and the announcer breaking in all of his life. and. He reaches adulthood, and one day he's telling this story for like the zillionth time, and he suddenly realizes that it has to be wrong. Because Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, and Major League Baseball is not played in December. One of the things I love about this story is that as it happens by now, this 13-year-old kid has grown up, he's gotten his PhD in psychology, and he's become one of the country's foremost memory researchers. <laughs> the guy's name was Ulrich Neisser, and he decided he was going to study flashbulb memories. So in 1986, when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, he immediately launched a huge study. What he did was the day after the explosion, he got a bunch of people to sit down and write out in as much detail as they could their memories of what had happened. And then he got in touch with all of them three years later, and he asked them to do the exact same thing. So what did he find? Turns out that fewer than 7% of the second reports matched the initial ones. 50% of them were wrong in 2 thirds of their claims. And 25% of them, one in four, was wrong in every major detail. I have to tell you guys that a couple of years ago, a consortium of scientists got together and they replicated this study with people's memories of September 11th. And they came up with the exact same findings. I know how vividly you remember that day. And I know that everybody in this room would love to be in the 7% of people with the good memories, right? Unfortunately, we cannot all be the statistical outliers out there on the far happy end of the graph. Second quick story. This one's really quick. It takes place two years ago down in Boston at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. This woman comes in for a surgery. She's anesthetized. She's taken into the operating room. Surgeon cuts her open, does his thing, stitches her back up, sends her out to the recovery room. 
And eventually she wakes up. And she looks down. And then she looks at the nurse standing next to her and she says, why is the wrong side of my body in bandages? So the surgeon was supposed to operate on her left leg and he operated on her right one. And when the Vice President for Healthcare Quality at Beth Israel discussed this incident, here's what he said. He said, for whatever reason, the surgeon simply felt that he was on the correct side of the patient. So you see where this is going. Trusting too much in the feeling of being on the correct side can be really dangerous. The lesson we learn from the illusion and from flashbulb memories and from this medical mistake is that this internal feeling of being right, no matter how convincing it is, is not a foolproof guide to what's happening in the external world. And this is why I told you I want to talk today about this habit of ours of looking inward to figure out if we're wrong, right? We see the first problem. The first problem is we can't trust completely this internal feeling of rightness. But I also want to talk about the feeling of wrongness. So let me ask you guys something. Just think to yourselves for a moment. What does it feel like to be wrong? You're probably thinking things like, it feels embarrassing and humiliating and confusing and frustrating and all of this. And those are great answers. But they're actually answers to a different question. Those are answers to the question of how it feels to realize that we're wrong about something. Realizing that we're wrong about something can feel like all of those things, and a lot more, actually. It can feel funny, it can feel baffling, it can feel illuminating. But just being wrong, you know, like going through life in the grips of some belief that you're later on is gonna decide, or you're gonna decide is false, that doesn't feel like anything. I call this problem error blindness. We are necessarily and definitionally unable to sense or feel or know about whatever beliefs we currently hold that might be wrong. I'll give you guys an analogy. You know this uh, Looney Tunes cartoon where there's this hopeless coyote who's over, always chasing a roadrunner and he never catches him? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so in, in pretty much every episode of this cartoon, there comes a moment where the roadrunner dashes off of a cliff, which is fine. It's a bird, right? It can fly. <laughs> and, and the coyote runs off the cliff after him. And what's great is he's totally fine, right? He just keeps running. And he's fine, he's fine, he's fine, right up until the moment that he looks down and he realizes that he's in midair. And then he falls. So when we're wrong about something, again, not when we realize it, but when we're just in that state of being wrong, we're like that coyote after he's gone off the cliff, but before he's looked down, right? We're already in trouble, but we think we're on solid ground. So I should actually revise myself a little bit. It does feel like something to be wrong. It feels like being right. So this is the situation that we're in. We can't trust the inner feeling of being right, because it sometimes misleads us. And we can't trust the inner feeling of being wrong because it basically doesn't exist until it's too late. So what are we supposed to do? Well, you know, when you think about it, the answer is kind of obvious. If we can't look inside to figure out whether or not we might be wrong, then we need to look outside. We need to look to each other. People who think about error prevention in high-risk domains already know this, right? They already know to externalize the solution to the fact that we are 
imperfect creatures. This is why we have things like co-pilots and airplanes and autopilots and things like shutoff valves and safety valves and all these kinds of devices that make sure that we are not relying on the internal psyche of one individual fallible human being in situations where the stakes are really high. And the wider you can cast this net, the more people you can recruit to help you figure out if you're wrong, the better off you are. This is why open source is a really great model for uncovering errors very quickly, making adjustments, and making corrections. And it's also why democratic cultures do better at preventing and discovering and correcting mistakes. I mean, you can imagine that if in that operating room in Beth Israel Hospital, the nurse and the physician's assistant and the medical student had felt empowered to turn to the surgeon and say, are you sure you're on the right side? That things would have gone really differently. So these measures that work so well in high stakes domains, these are things that we all need to do in our own lives as well. We also need to externalize the problem of how to figure out when we've got it right and when we've got it wrong. We need other people. And specifically, and somewhat difficultly, we need people who disagree with us. We need to invite the doubters and the critics and the adversaries into the conversation with us. And I want to leave you guys today with this idea from philosophy that I think really nicely unites this notion that we are an intrinsically fallible species with this idea that we need other people to help us identify and correct our mistakes. And I need to apologize to the pop tech organizers because they expressly ask us not to use jargon in our presentations. And unfortunately, this lovely philosophical idea, here's what it's called. <laughs> it's called the pessimistic meta-induction from the history of science. <laughs> it's a terrible name, I'm sorry. But it means something really simple, actually. Basically, a bunch of philosophers of science looked back on the entire history of scientific discovery and advancement, and they observed that over the course of time, every major scientific theory that at one point has just seemed absolutely brilliant and bulletproof has eventually proved wrong. And they drew from this the obvious conclusion, which is that sooner or later, our own, most of our own, beloved, widely held, and seemingly right scientific theories are going to prove wrong as well. This insight is not specific to science. When you think about it, pretty much every domain, right, economics, technology, politics, how we heal diseases, what foods we think we should eat, how we believe we should raise our children, how we believe we should educate them. In all of these cases, and a whole lot more, one generation's idea of an absolute truism very often becomes the next generation's idea of folly and falsehood. So much so that really we might as well have a pessimistic meta-induction from the history of everything. But here's the thing, this insight is really only pessimistic if you hate being wrong. And you don't want to find out about your mistakes. If by contrast, you believe that discovering our mistakes is one of the best ways to revise and enhance and expand our understanding of the world, then actually this insight is incredibly optimistic. One of the people who put this best to my mind was the philosopher Richard Rorty, who said this really lovely thing. He said that embracing our own fallibility is really just a way of embracing the permanent possibility of someone having a better idea. We need each other to do this. We need each other to help us find our own mistakes and turn them into better ideas, into 
better oil rigs and better financial systems and better criminal justice procedures and also better conferences and better conversations and better relationships and in the end, maybe even a slightly better world. Thank you guys so much.